everyone. Thank you for joining us on this little bit cloudy Saturday afternoon here in Boulder, Colorado, but hopefully where you're at, it's uh, sun is shining. Um, I am joined by not only a colleague who I highly respect, but a dear friend, Dr. Shalish Pratt, and just so excited to have her on today to talk about naturopathic medicine. And if you have maybe experienced that before or you haven't, hopefully you'll learn a lot more by the end of this um, Zoom call. I would love for you guys to share if you find this interesting um, and write your comments because we'll be either during the call looking at those and trying to answer your questions um, or we'll come back later and, and answer questions, give resources as much as we can. So just know that those will be read and uh, we will be answering those. So I'd love to just start by introducing my friend formally and then um, we'll jump right into the conversation. So Dr. Pratt believes in integrative and holistic medicine. We totally share this mindset. Her practice and clinic are focused on neurology and complex medical conditions relating to metabolic disease. She is so brilliant. I know you guys will notice on this call. Um, I know when we talk pathways and stuff, it's so much fun, but I'm always impressed by her ability to really look at all this stuff in the complex level um, that we need to when we have these kind of patients. She uses functional medicine and her expertise in biochemistry and methylation and physiology to help patients get to the root cause of their symptoms through a strategic approach. The modalities she uses, we're going to talk about, you're going to hear a little bit more about what she does, are nutrition, diet, nutritional supplements, botanicals, environmental medicine, classic homeopathy, and hydrotherapy. Uh, many patients come to her office after seeing other doctors and are scared, frustrated, and looking for answers that no one's been able to figure out. She's a de sorry, detective like I am. Um, she often tells people that she looks at medicine like a detective. She looks for clues that have led to the current health situation and um, looks for a strategy to find, figure out, um, no matter how complex your illness, what the root cause is. And as you can see on her website, um, we'll be sharing this to all of our, both of our social media outlets. Um, she's been featured on some really great other interviews and um, I'm just delighted to have her. So thank you for joining me today, Shalise. It's, it's such a, a wonderful experience to be here and, and it's so much fun to spend time with you again. So um, I look forward to it. Yeah, it's kind of like us having coffee only live. <laughs> so, exactly. We're well, just missing a few of our friends that often join in. <laughs> and I'm just going to, before we proceed, I'm going to make sure that I see this on the page. It looks like we're live, but I'm going to, I would like to double check before we get in too far. Sure. Getting is on board and that you guys can see us and hear us. And yeah, we, we're on. Okay, cool. So, um, I'd love to hear, um, well, first of all, I just want to tell people a little bit about how we met. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I mean, we've both been in the Boulder area of practicing. And I know from my perspective, I heard your name and I always had great respect because it's funny, word of mouth really is our best advertising. And I would hear from if, you know, patients, families that maybe have saw someone for you and me. And we do a little different things, which we'll talk about today. So we do have some patients in common at times that get benefits from both of our different approaches. But I just remember like having this great respect and thinking you were not just a great practitioner and brilliant, but I loved your spirit and your heart and the way you approach medicine. And I remember us having coffee at my office and kind of getting to know you and the kind of kids that you saw and really all ages, but a lot of the um, you know, kids on the spectrum and that kind of thing and just being really impressed. And then later we've gotten together for coffee and become very close friends. And what I love the most is we really not only think about mind, body, and spirit, which you'll talk about in a few minutes, but we live that like on a spiritual realm, it's really important to kind of incorporate that into who we are and how we practice. And it was such an encouragement to me to share on that level with you as well. So it's been a real, real joy to call you friend and, um, and someone I respect so much. So I'd love to hear first, before we talk about naturopathic medicine, I kind of want to hear everybody loves stories of like, why did you get into medicine? How did you get called into it? I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and how you got into naturopathic medicine. Sure. Um, so how I got into naturopathic medicine was I started out, well, I, I started with some health concerns. Early on in life, um, we had a cat in the house and my mother thought that I had lots of allergies, seasonal allergies to many things. Well, you know, later we found out it was the cats that we had in the house, but I had had lots of alert allergies. And then in my, in my later teens around 19, I developed pretty sincere, severe 
asthma, um, where it really started taking away the function of my life. At, at 20 years old, just walking up a, a flight of stairs was, it would put me out of breath and I would get every cold and flu that came through. I was constantly sick. And, um, and I remember one day, you know, being on so many steroids mm-hmm. um, to, to, to manage the amount of, of asthma that I had and these, these uh, respiratory infections that I just couldn't shake. And I, you know, I was really frustrated. And so I was started looking for other answers and I read a book by Andrew Weil. Oh yeah. <laughs> Spontaneous healing. And in it, he talked about um, naturopathic medicine. And for me, it was like a light bulb went off because I had been looking into medicine. I had thought about maybe a DO or going to MD, but I was feeling frustrated in the, in the paradigm that I was in. I, I'm, I remember having such, being on so much prednisone that I broke out in shingles. And when I asked the doctor, why do I have shingles? They said, do you have a computer? And I said, how did my computer give me shingles? And she said, no, go look it up. And she walked out of the room. Wow. And this is just primary care. Like they don't have a lot of time. You know, I understand that now. But at the moment, I was like, I want a kind of medicine that's going to help me understand how this happened. Why am I so sick all the time? And um, slowly but surely, I did regain my health. I, I kind of left um, all the things that I had grew, grew up to believe that I needed to do, like take a lot of antihistamines, take albuterol. I mean, eventually, um, I didn't need those things. I, I didn't go off of them until I had other um, symptoms that had abated, right? I didn't have the asthma problems anymore. So I no longer needed it, but I changed my diet. That was a big part of it. I, I found out at, you know, just my early twenties, I, I couldn't eat gluten and dairy. I couldn't eat soy. Um, and, and that made a huge impact of me recovering, just being able to breathe deeply. I also needed to look at, you know, I had wonderful, amazing parents who wanted to keep me close and I needed um, psychologically, mentally, spiritually to understand, you know, the feelings of being a little bit repressed. Like I, I wasn't allowed to go away to college. And I think that played into my asthma as well. So I started, I started going down all these avenues, um, preparing myself and healing myself in the process before I went on to, to medical school at national in Portland. So um, that is, is kind of my journey as, as I started changing my diet, I started thinking differently, I started um, really you know, blossoming in my ability to fledge after college. And I did, like going to Portland, Oregon was probably one of the best things personally that I could do in order for me to have confidence and know that A, I really wanted to help other people that had illnesses like I did that didn't know what to do. I wanted to be um, a voice of compassion and love and encouragement and let them know your body can heal. That this, I I, I hold that in my heart for you. So that's, that's how I got there. Oh, I love it. And I, I, we've never really talked about this, you know, over coffee, but it's so fun to hear your journey and What's interesting is I have such a parallel journey because when I was a child on the farm, I had horrible allergies. I didn't have asthma, but the same mechanism of atopic diseases, right? I had eczema and allergies. You had asthma, and those are the three things in this whole. And you also mentioned something really important. As I've looked at my past, there's a piece of this. I think we came into the world as very intuitive, sensitive souls, right? And that's why we want to be healers. Like I was called into medicine as I know you were too. We maybe didn't know it, but we were, this is a calling. It's not just a job for us. And Mm -hmm. part of that is this sense, this nature that is actually very sensitive. And with that comes a great ability to connect with people and understand complex detective work, which we totally Mm -hmm. align with. But at the same time, So that's the gift side of it. We are sensitive, intuitive souls, and we bring to medicine an ability to really look into the the patient at the soul level and at the the whole environmental level, and then to really understand at a deeper level because we see details that other people will miss. Like you, people have seen a lot of other people before they get to you, Mm -hmm. and so they're looking for answers. But on the other side of that, the, the blessing and the curse is that we are super sensitive to our environment. 
So whether it's chemicals or allergies or asthma, and any of you listeners out there, if you have struggled with allergies or asthma or atopic, it's probably because you're going to be one of the canaries that's also more sensitive to environmental chemicals and to, and even emotional stuff, right? Like I'm mm-hmm. a little bit more sensitive, but it's, it's so interesting because there's no um, coincidence about the fact that we both had these allergies and atopic conditions and then the calling into medicine. And even though that was tough as a child, it's been a blessing to the things that we do today because we have this gift of being able to really see at a deeper level. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So I'd love to hear, as we've told everybody, like, tell us a little bit more about what is, for those who don't really know about naturopathic medicine and naturopathic doctors, um, what's your training? What are some of the principles of naturopathic medicine? So we have six principles in naturopathic medicine that define us. And the first one, I mean, in functional medicine, you've adopted many of these. So some of them... Um, kind of stolen them from you, really. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful because lots of people are getting really wonderful care. Um, and it was born out of a lot of, mm-hmm. um, of this nature cure and these principles. So the first one is the healing pow- power of nature. And the body has an intrinsic ability to establish, maintain, and restore health. Mm-hmm. So we as NDs believe that if we, put sh- if we put back into balance what's in excess or what's in deficiency and bring you into balance, then your body can restore itself through physiology, through biochemistry. Uh, so th- that's, that's the first one is, is healing through the power of nature and using um, less invasive means. We try to use um, the least Im- uh, invasive means possible. So that may be through nutrition and diet. It may be sunshine. It may be clean air. All of the environmental medicine you'll see is part of our mainstay of how we look at medicine. So we identify and treat the cause. Um, That's our second uh, uh, principle. And um, symptoms are expressions of the body's attempts to heal itself. We see if you start to have a symptom, it means your body's trying to show us we need something's out of balance, something's not working correctly. And so like Jill, we, we go to the root cause. Um, and that may be, you know, all the way down to a cellular level and how nutrients are shuttled across a cell membrane or how genomics are functioning within our body. So treating the cause, first do no harm. You know, all doctors I think have this one, um, this principle, but you know, my first and foremost, and my patients all know this, is I, I'm a fairly conservative ND and that I don't want to do anything that harms you, right? So um, any eat, that could be even be a side effect of a nutrient or a supplement or homeopathic. So um, that's the third is do no harm. Treat the whole person. So as Jill alluded to earlier, um, we look at the interaction of the physical, the spiritual, the mental, emotional, genetic, environmental, and social factors. All of it together makes up your health. And we're going we're gonna to dive into some of these other, some of these individually, I'm sure, in this talk. But we believe that all of these parts are your health. Your, your mind, your body, your spirit all need to be healed and have healing. And then we have doctor as teacher. So my first, you know, principle and oath to you is if you see me in my practice, I want to empower you. I want to teach you. I want you to walk away knowing how to take responsibility and making different choices that heal you on all of these levels. And then prevention, right? How do we prevent, whether it's through um, epigenetics, like finding ways to prevent health issues that have plagued your, your, your ancestry, or whether it's you, um, you know, you didn't even know something in your home, like toxic mold, was making you so sick, and pr- and it could end up really harming your health in years to come, 10, 20 years from now. So it's finding all of these principles and treating on all of these levels. Mm, Gosh, thank you for explaining that because I have been around a lot of naturopaths. I have such great respect 
Um, what's neat is I, um, you know, our allopathic, like we call it training. I remember, Shalise, I don't know if you know this or not, but before I was in undergrad and then looking at what professional schools, and I knew I wanted to go into a healing profession. Um, and kind of like you, I didn't know exactly what. And I remember actually applying to naturopathic school, applying to chiropractic school, applying to traditional Chinese medical school, and then applying to the allopathic schools. And it's funny because I always like didn't really quite align with them. And when it came down to it, my decision was only based on the fact that sadly our system, as we clearly can see nowadays, is so predominantly, and say I wanted to do mission work, it's still more allopathically minded to go overseas and do that kind of work, or even just the reimbursement system and stuff. And sadly, um, you guys are getting more and more accreditation, ability to practice in any state and all of that. Um, and you're considered a physician, which is awesome. Um, but I know it has been a hard battle. And I remember my decision was just like, okay, if I want to change the system, I'm going to actually go into the system and infiltrate. <laughs> and I joke because I'm like, I have the heart of a naturopath. Like I feel <laughs> way more aligned with you and your training and how you view the world and patients. You just said like, hopefully how I, I practice as well, um, sure. but it's not common. And so what I get excited about is if we can train and educate not only patients to know that they could see someone like you and get great benefit, Mm -hmm. um, and then second, just even other doctors like um, allopathic physicians to know what else there is. It's almost like my toolbox gets to be a lot bigger. Um, and so we can, you know, hopefully bring that today. So thanks for sharing all that background. Of course. And, and that's the beauty is we, we are integrative, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you're functional. I mean, I've studied a lot of functional medicine as well, like the level at which I went to with biochemistry and methylation specifically, you know, studying with Jill James back in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that set me up to have like really wonderful conversations with any, any discipline of medicine. And I truly believe we're all working for our patients, right? We're all, my heart is that if, if I'm not, if I don't have the tools in my toolbox, which I'm very confident of the ones that I do have, but if I don't have that, I want them to have it. And that's the reason why many, many, uh, we've shared several patients over the last probably 15 years or at least 14. I remember going back, yeah. um, just us being in the same, I think you were with Bob Roundtree mm -hmm. back then. Um, and Bob Roundtree, I remember him saying that too. I remember him coming to meetings yeah. and saying, I have the heart and soul. Oh, and <laughs> exactly. And so there is we this. We want to be like you. We were like, <laughs> we're like we, wanna, we really want to be like you. <laughs> but but you're, you're absolutely right. It, it, when you, I remember um, my, my graduation, um, my keynote speaker, he basically sent us out on our graduation day knowing we were climbing a mountain for the rest of our lives. So yeah. it takes a certain personality to not take offense. Yes. Yeah. Um, to know that um, we, we are doing um, good work. Mm -hmm. And um, even if, if we have to educate people. So doctor as teacher is really big in, my, in the medicine that I, I use because we're constantly teaching. We're teaching about our education. We're teaching about our licensure. We're teaching about our, you know, the authorities that we have. We're teaching about how we are, we are, we should be integrated. We should work well, play nice in the sandbox with everybody. Um, which I, I'm, I'm committed to doing that. When I first got out of school, I actually went around to some of the most um, allopathic, old school practices, like the Rocky Mountain Tr uh, Cancer Treatment Center. Uh -huh. I spent two weeks uh, with, with a doctor there. And, you know, from the moment he was, he just knew my mother. And I just, I wanted to get to know the other side that, that sometimes didn't believe in my education or didn't know about my education. And by the end of those two weeks, whether it was him or at the pediatric center or some of these other very traditional practices, they were all comfortable with referring to me. So it's building bridges, not yeah. building or, um, ravines. Yeah. So, Gosh, yeah. I love that because even though I was out in alphabet medicine, I was back in Illinois for many years practicing. And I remember 
I got out of residency, went to the CEO of the hospital and said, hey, you need integrative medicine. I'll be your director. And so they hired me. I don't know what they were thinking, but um, we created a center there. And I remember like the docs in town, the gastroenterologist, and the rheumatologist, and the, all the specialists were kind of like, what in the world is she doing? And they did not, they just didn't, they weren't sure. Um, and what ended up happening, I definitely had visits, but even more, and I'm sure you've had this as well, the patient with arthritis from the rheumatologist would come to me and they'd get better and they'd go back. And then the gastroenterologist, I'd see a Crohn's patient and they'd come to me and they'd get better and they'd go back. I didn't really have to say anything, but after a few years, they were calling and saying, uh, what are you doing over there? We don't understand this. We weren't taught in medical school that Crohn's is reversible or that arthritis is reversible or that autoimmunity in general. So it was interesting. And I'm sure you've had that too, where it's just, you live your practice and your life and you do the right thing and you help people heal. And the proof is in the pudding, right? Because these patients yes. will eventually, like our best advertisement for both of us is word of mouth. Um, because people get well and um, then they tell their friends and family and um, that's exciting. So I want to shift gears just a little bit because I know there's something we share and um, I, I often do talk publicly about it, but it's like we talk about the mind, body, spirit, and especially nowadays with what's going on. Mm -hmm. To me, it's so hard to imagine if people don't have some connection to a higher power and a spiritual belief system. And you and I both know, like, we're, we're super open-minded. Anyone out there listening, doesn't matter if you don't believe in a God or you do, um, but this piece of, of who we are and what we bring to medicine is actually really important. And we don't necessarily, we might ask patients questions to find out where they're at. We don't always share what, what we believe, but I would love to know a little bit about how your spiritual practice and beliefs have, have flavored who you are and, and what you bring to the table. Because I think that's so important for us to be real and authentic as practitioners and how it's in our life. Because for me, sure. it's, it's the most important thing in my life is my faith and um, the power of prayer and all of those things. Yeah, so I, um, I was raised Christian, um, Catholic actually, Roman Catholic, and I, I still am a, a very devout Catholic. Um, so when I very first started my practice, I remember getting very discouraged when uh, the, 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 the plan didn't go as well as it should have gone. And I remember at one point having a conversation with my mother and my mother basically said, who are you to believe that it's you? Mm -hmm. And in that moment, she shifted my whole perspective of what I was doing in medicine. I'm in service. I'm in service to my my faith um, and the grace of God. And so anyone that sees me, it's, it's their higher purpose to get better and it's God's plan. And I'm just holding space, giving them information and knowing that they're going to um, get better. And I hold in my heart and pray in my heart with ev for every person I've ever seen that that what we're doing is going to bring them to their highest purpose, right? That, that God can, can help them and, and, and bring that through. And I get to be in the front seat of all of these amazing miracles I've seen over the last 16 years. And I, I don't take credit for a lot of it, even though a lot of times I will get credit, but it's not really mine. It's really my faith. And it's really that I'm serving through my spirit, their spirit. Uh, so I, and like I said before, in, in, my, in, in this medicine, as an ND, we believe that your spiritual health is just as important as your physical and mental health. And it, it provides us with so much a richness in our life if we have a faith tradition. It doesn't have to be a religion. It doesn't have to be executed one way or, or another. But finding, a, finding a, a, a moment where we can surrender and get and get a touch of grace is, is so important to our health, especially in times when, yes, this virus is out there and yes, there's lots of suicide and alcoholism and pain that's mm -hmm. come with, or that has come with this social distancing, right? We should really call it physical distancing, but, but this is, it's really hard on our psyche. It's really hard on our spirit to be away from our loved ones, to be away from our friends and the encouragement and the, and the way in which we embrace each other 
um, both physically and emotionally and spiritually. And we're not able to do that right now. And so I think this conversation is really important to have today while we're still in this situation. How do we foster more grace in our life? How do we foster surrender? And as you talked about, I've watched several of your wonderful um, interviews that you've given with other people. And what I've noticed is, is this idea of resilience. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it's our faith and, and whatever tradition that is that brings us resilience. I know for a fact that's true in my life. Some of the hardest situations I look back on and I truly think, you know, God, for the reason why I got through some of that with the resilience that I did. Because, yeah. and, and same with, you know, whenever somebody gets through something, you know, I want to, I just want to celebrate with them. I want them to know, like, you are, you are being watched over. You, you aren't alone. Um, my, my heart is with you. And I know that there's, there's, there's something, whatever you believe in, that's also with you. So. Yes. Oh gosh, this is so beautiful. And thank you for being so, if there's ever time for us to show up and be so authentic and real, because a lot of times this isn't really talked about and yet it's so critical. I, I mean, I remember when the pandemic first started and a lot of the stuff was new and there was so much fear and there's still fear, right? But if you think about our health is at risk, we don't know if we're going to get sick or die. Um, finances for many, many people listening out there, they've lost jobs, they've lost security, they've lost their relationships are in jeopardy. Not that they're going to lose their family, but they're not in connection like they might be used to or their dear mother who's older, they might not be able to be with her because she's at risk for getting the virus or so and, and children might be separated or there's just so many different things here. And pretty much on all level of what we perceive as our security um, it's all shake. It's all shaken up. And for me, I realized, oh my goodness, if I didn't have a belief that there is purpose in all things and there is good things that come even through suffering and difficulties, like I have such a strong, I know you do too, a belief in that through any adversity or through any circumstance, um, there is good and there's purpose and meaning. And it's almost like um, what you were saying too, resilience. Really, if we tried to define that word, it would be about finding purpose and meaning in suffering. And I didn't realize it 25 when I had cancer, but when I started to see the pattern shortly after I had cancer, I realized, oh goodness, my life is supposed to be about experiential suffering and then sharing the lessons I've learned. And so now I'm like, bring it on, God. <laughs> I don't know what's next, but I'm not afraid. I mean, you could... I, I shouldn't say I'm not afraid. We're all human, right? So there's like, oh, that might be hard or it might be painful. But I know, I know now, suffering uh, cancer, Crohn's, mold illness, um, loss of loved ones, pandemics, there's nothing that my God and I can't handle. And the same with you out there. It's like this beautiful sense of after having been through these things, pandemic, whatever, I've been through cancer. I've been through, you know, I know I can handle this because I have a sense. It's almost like they talk about, you know, a ship that's tossed to and fro about the, the um, ocean. And if there's an anchor plugged into some source that's greater than the purpose of just our own lives and ourselves, then you can stand strong amidst the waves and the storms. And, um, and I love that we can bring that to our patients because you know as well as I, so many people who walk in, they're at their last wit's end. And they've been other places and they have symptoms that no one's been able to explain. And I know you share this with me, when we just bring love and hope, like we just sit there and give them space to be heard and look at them and sometimes i'll cry with patients i must not even shy about that i'll look at them they'll be shedding a tear i'm like yeah i feel you <laughs> and i'm like wiping tears away and it's funny because in medical school they're like you should be objective and you should not shed a tear and you should you know remain and I'm like screw that <laughs> because if I, because i really i mean we're human beings and so when we can feel and interact on that level that starts the healing and then when i can say you know what um, I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers, but I will do everything in my power to help you and to facilitate healing. And I loved what you said too, because it's not really about us. We're just creating this space and this environment. And often it's like taking out toxins or adding back in nutrients. It's really simple. That's a funny thing. People think it's complex. It's not really complex. <laughs> and if we get it, if we get those things, those basic things, right, the body will heal. It's like miracles every day we see because yeah. We just allow, and then I do believe both you and I bring love and hope and our faith, which we don't ever 
push on anyone else, but we just bring a place there where we know where we stand and we know our purpose and our calling. And we know that for that time, we are there with you and um, holding space for you wherever you're at. And even if you don't believe or don't have, that's okay. There's no that's judgment, okay. but it's, it's just- It does not that. have to be that's, one way. It, it can be- it can be multiple ways, but I want to encourage people right now, you know, with the amount of stress that we're in of all the things that you talked about earlier, whether it's economic or whether it's this social isolation that we're in, um, it, it creates, you know, quinolinic acid. It creates our, our, our mal A creates more peroxides, right? For it just being in stress makes us more, um, you know, susceptible to disease and, and, our, inf and our inflammation goes up and our, our detoxification systems start to crash and then our immune system isn't working so well. So we're ta I'm talking about um, the, the importance of just simple things of having gratitude and knowing that's, that, that you are taking care of, you know, or, or finding ways to tiptoe into that grace if you're, if you're, um, not so comfortable with it. And it, it doesn't have to look like one way or another, but yes, my heart, um, and my, and my giant spirit want, want everyone to, to feel better. And I, I think what I get, um, criticized the most for from my family is I really don't like suffering. <laughs> I just, I really want to help in yeah. some way. So, um, so people don't need to suffer, but um, we've got some pretty amazing tools in our tool bag, and and this is one of them. You know that we bring our heart into our practice, and we truly care. And we would never ask them to do something that we couldn't do ourselves. Yeah. So, I love that because that's the thing too. The model the teacher has. The, I mean, we we both same thing. We need to actually live and model um, what we you know practice what we preach or, or teach our patients about let's talk more practical then about mm -hmm. um i definitely want to talk about fever because that i know naturopathic yes. let's talk about that and then i want to go into a little bit of the immune system and set, everything from mind body spirit of how we can actually support immune function during this time but let's mm -hmm. first talk about the enigma of fever so what does a naturopath believe about fever and how would you treat it or not treat it or tell me more about that so we look at fever as a as an, a vital force in your body that raises up. So children often can run really high, really fruitful fevers if given the opportunity um, against any kind of virus or bacteria or infection. And so there are parameters, right? And you should work with your doctor to know what those parameters are. I'm going to say a fever over 103, we probably should manage it. And I'm going to give some examples of how we, we would look at that. So if you're running a really high fever or even a hundred degree fever, that's still considered, that's a low grade fever. We often use something called hydrotherapy, which um, one of the, one of the ones are one of the treatments that I've used on in my practice, gosh, for 20 years now, is you take um, socks, cotton socks, and you put them in tepid water, not cold, not super cold, not warm at all, just tepid, room temperature water, you wring them out really well, you put them on your feet, this is if you have a fever, and then you put wool socks over them, and then you get into bed. And what that will do, if you have a head cold, it will bring the mucus down the inflammation out of your head it will go to your feet and warm up those socks and until those socks are dry it brings down the fever and it helps congestion and inflammation in your head and your upper respiratory system so that's one way we would manage a fever we can if it gets really high sometimes we put people in tepid baths mm -hmm. to bring down the fever and then we also use uh, homeopathy right so some of the best remedies to use for really high fever, it would be belladonna. For a lower grade, grade fever, it would be ferrum foss. But these are, these are different techniques that you can do to manage a fever rather than just giving ibuprofen or Tylenol, mm -hmm. which can really deplete us of our glutathione, which is our master antioxidant. So we usually encourage fevers to a point, right? And, and at that point, we don't want a febrile seizure. We don't want 
Um, we don't want elderly people having really high fevers either. So we will, we will use whatever means we can to bring down that fever, but the importance of letting the fever run, which I don't think I've discussed, but I think you know, is that um, it, it dis dis disassembles that virus, right? Or it kills bacteria when, we are, when our cytokines and our body can run that inflammatory response. So what most people don't know is a lot of times it, the virus or the bacteria isn't making you feel so bad. It's your body's reaction to it. And we want to manage that reaction, but with, it, with the intent of it's doing a good job of dismantling or killing bacteria, mm -hmm. dismantling a virus. And that makes so much sense as I was in Switzerland the last two years with their biological medicine and they, I love that their typical allopathic physicians really incorporate homeopathy. And so it's almost like a combination of the U.S. It's almost like if you and I had both of our trainings combined, that's what typically the German Swiss physicians do is they bring this all together. And one of the treatments they have there is called hyperthermia. It's basically causing a fever. And I've had many of my patients who have gone to Europe who've gotten treated for Lyme disease or tick-borne infections or viral, chronic viral infections that are almost in a curative state afterwards after they get several sessions of hyperthermia. And it, of course, it's controlled. It's under medical supervision because they'll go very high, um, and like extremely high, but they're watching blood pressure. They're watching vitals. They're watching oxygenation. They're making sure that it's safe. But it, it's been... Hydration. Yes, and hydration. Exactly. <laughs> it's been profound though to see that. And we don't typically in our U.S. hospitals have hyperthermia, but in Europe, right. standard of care for some of these patients. So it actually makes sense to me. They've used nature cure in Europe mm -hmm. for centuries. Yeah. So yes, um, sauna, you know, mm -hmm. helping people initiate because some people with chronic Epstein-Barr virus, right? This is, we're just trying to find a way to help the body again, get rid of the pathogen the best way it can. When sometimes our immune system, we need to support it, right? With either nutrition or diet or lifestyle or reducing environmental toxins or all of these things help the body be able to ha handle how the immune system is going to create an, an antigen and then an antibody um, to, to manage these infections. And so we manage fevers. We don't discourage fevers. Um, and yes, it is a little uncomfortable and it's a whole other conversation as a parent to have to tell you, your child is not going to feel so great when they have a really decent fever. And I just had to explain to my son when he was little, we're going to do these socks. You're going to feel better real soon. Just wait. Mm -hmm. and here's some homeopathy. And, and we got through it. And he, he definitely um, didn't feel well when the fever was really high, but when we managed it, and put the, you know, the warming sock treatment on and used Ferrum Foss. And that was the remedy that always worked for him. Um, you know, even at 17, he'll come to me and say, mom, I'm sick. I need these things. I love it. So. <laughs> okay. Wow. Oh, let's talk about like practical ways. So immune system, obviously that's the big thing now. And, and, sure. and I'd love to just talk about like people listening, what are some practical ways that they can support their immune system um, in this time? Well, I think you've covered it, um, but it's really important. I think you had another ND, the one that's in your office, come on and talk about stress. Mm -hmm. You know, managing stress is key right now. Yeah. Really important. Most of my patients, they're coming to me in the last couple days and saying, I'm starting to come down with something, had something really stressful that mm -hmm. made them feel that way. So because when we get really stressed, our immune system goes down. Our natural killer cells go down. We just can't fight um, infection as well. Uh, diet is really important. Sugar. Do you, do you, I, I know that there's a study out there saying something like your immune system goes down for six hours after a significant amount of sugar. So staying away from sugar right now is probably a really good idea. And it doesn't mean forevermore. Um, I'm, I'm all about moderation, meaning if you have a birthday coming up, do all the other things to support yourself, but maybe you can have a piece of your favorite whatever with sugar in it. Just don't go eating that cake for seven days, right? right? <laughs> so, um, too, I was just, you read my mind on sugar because I was thinking sugar is such a toxic thing for the immune system. I mean, like you said, the studies show natural killer cells go dramatically down for the time after. And interesting, just this morning, I saw someone post something on 
uh, cereal cells, like uh, box cereal cells are up like by 24%. Mm-hmm. And as people are home, I'm like, oh gosh, box cereal is probably one of the most, if you have breakfast box cereal, please, please find some alternative because <laughs> it's not only GMO crops like corn and soy, there's glyphosate sprayed on most of those and then it's refined and it's high sugar. There's so many things about most box cereals that are just like not a good breakfast. <laughs> In addition to all of that, there's also a a film that they put on the inside of your cereal bag that's, I think it's a flame retardant, that actually creates a lot of toxicity for you too. So it, it, it drives your insulin to wacky levels, it, it brings down your immune system. So it might be a good time to break up a cereal. I know it's a comfort <laughs> food, but. <laughs> and I say that with love, you know, I, like yeah. I know that it's comfort. People are looking for any kind of comfort. Let's just find other beautiful ways to, you know, getting up first thing in the morning and going and, and going outside and hearing the birds, you know, maybe that would bring you more than, than the cereal. But I, I understand why people are eating more cereal. Yeah. Um, but yes, so, so it's, it's, it's eliminating or, or reducing sugar intake is going to really help immune function, staying away from foods that you might be sensitive to, right? If, if, for instance, I can't eat gluten and dairy, I will end up with sinus. I'll start getting a tickle in the back of my throat with just even eating a little bit of dairy. I have a friend that whenever I'd stay at her house in Connecticut, if I had dairy, she'd call me out. She's like, you just had dairy. I can hear it in your Uh nose because it happens so fast for me. Um, So it's avoiding those foods that we're sensitive to because they cause inflammation through our whole GI tract, which then spills over to inflammation throughout our body. Do you want to speak a little bit well, more to that? Many people with the dairy, it's a mucus producer. So mm-hmm. not everyone, but for you, for me as well, I completely agree that when you get that mucus produced in your sinuses or your gut, it's actually harder to clear pathogens like viruses. So you're actually putting yourself at a disadvantage from the immune perspective too, because you've got all this gunk sitting there that can kind of trap the particles, trap the viruses, and it makes it harder to clear. Um, and I would love to just talk really quickly about like, what, what's a typical breakfast for you? And I'll share mine too, because maybe some people are wondering, well, what in the world if I can't have cereal? What do you do, Dr. Pratt, for breakfast? <laughs> you know, I try to switch it up. I, I'm, I, I am a true believer that we should have different nutrition rotating through our diet. But like anyone else, my life gets really busy and I fall back to certain things. And one of those certain things is I have Metaclear by Thorne mm-hmm. Research and I take two scoops of that. I add some coconut milk or almond milk or hemp milk. Um, and then I add a mixed berry, um, just some mixed berries with that. And that usually is great. And it has my multivitamin in it. Um, it's just a great, it's just a way, great way for me to start my day. Otherwise it It would be, I can do eggs. Mm -hmm. So I'll do eggs with some sauteed vegetables um, if I have time in the morning or um, every once in a while. I I do, I am also sensitive to histamine. So I have to watch how much histamine I can take in. Uh, But if I, if I do have something that's higher histamine, I may do like a chicken apple sausage or something like that too. What about you? What's your oh, breakfast? Good, good, good. Well, I love that you said the variety because I get in I get in habits where I'm eating the same thing every day because it's mm-hmm. easy. And um, I've gone. I love the smoothies. I haven't done them lately, but I in the past have frequently done. Um, I like the Thorn Vega Light, but I like the Medicare that that Dr. Pratt is mentioning is kind of like a detox shake. So it's really great because it has all the N acetylcysteine and the glutathione and all the precursors. Uh, it's chocolate flavor. Well, it comes vanilla or chocolate, but chocolate's much better. <laughs> I real, take a vanilla, but yeah, yeah, either chocolate. way. Um, but I would often do the that with some leafy greens and then some chia or flax, like you said, very similar coconut milk. What I've done lately is I'll do a grain free cereal that's very low sugar, and there's one that's sprouted from I think Lark Ellen Farms, and the other one I like is Purely Elizabeth, which now Costco carries, so it's so cool. And they're both organic, grain-free um, cereals, and I'll put a little coconut milk on them, or just eat them plain if I have time. It's that's my simplest go-to, um, and uh, and, it, and it works. I sadly can't do eggs. So, um, and a lot of you out there, you might be doing more ketogenic or you might be doing more uh, intermittent fasting. So some of you might do like a bulletproof coffee, a clean organic coffee with some brain octane or 
or some MCT oil or, um, or just, um, I, I like my coconut creamer in there that's super clean from, uh, I think, um, Vital Proteins makes a really good coconut creamer. Um, so all those things are great. Um, and if you're intermittent fasting, a lot of times you won't eat breakfast when you first wake up, but you'll have your first meal at like 11 and that works. Sadly for me personally, as I've never done well on a high fat diet, I'm one of those two people. I have pancreatic insufficiency, so I, I can't really do a super high fat diet. So I have to kind of balance the lower glycemic carbs. I often do berries as well. So organic berries with whatever other protein and fats that I'm eating. Um, but a lot of you listening might do well with a breakfast that's fat and protein based like eggs and organic turkey bacon or sausage or those kinds of things tend to keep people going really well. And I often say, especially with adrenal issues, to have more of a fat and protein in the morning and have your carbs in the evening like rice or quinoa or sweet potatoes as a side. Um, versus our sugary cereals in the morning. They just set us up because if you start with a sugary cereal, your insulin spikes up, your blood sugar spikes up, that insulin tells your body to store sugar. So three hours later, you're ravenous and you're looking for the brownies. Um, so it, and your cortisol it, gets messed up, right? Yeah, yeah. And then your cortisol is also in there playing tricks on you and lowering your immune system. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I think we're talking about fiber and protein and good fats are so important to balance that blood sugar. Yeah. So that people's in, in, and it'll help your immune system dramatically. Yeah. How often people are following all day long that, um, that, and they understand when you tell them, aren't you how three hours later, are you like ravenous looking for like, yeah, you know, what's up with that? It all depends like really your first meal of the day, whether you're fasting or not, is the most important meal for both cortisol and blood mm -hmm. sugar and insulin. And even if you want to lose weight or be metabolically active and healthy, um, that first thing that you put in your mouth in the morning is really critical to think about. Uh, so cereal, sadly, not a great idea. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but chia pudding, chia pudding yeah. would be yeah. a great, you know, with some berries. I think you, you had a, a recipe too with avocado. Yeah. Um, yeah. Avocado so, chocolate, uh, it's like chocolate pudding. It's so good and it's actually healthy. So on the website, we'll have to find that and post it because it's so, it tastes like chocolate pudding and you're basically eating avocados. It's so good. <laughs> so, so this lifestyle doesn't have to feel um, really restrictive in that way when you start to, to gain an appreciation of different kinds of sweet, right? Mm -hmm. um, using some of these alternative, um, just the berries become sweet. Yeah. Yeah, what's your favorite recommendations for sweeteners for patients if they're making a recipe or doing something? What, what do you usually tell them for alternatives? I, I mean, I still believe honey and, mm -hmm. and maple syrup are still a good idea, uh, unless you, you're really restricting carbs, mm -hmm. um, like on a specific carbohydrate diet or GAPS. Um, but monk fruit would probably be in there. Um, xylitol, you know, uh, that also helps kill yeast. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, those would probably be my favorites. What about you? Actually, I totally agree. I do use stevia a lot because it, it had, has had some studies. It's a biofilm disruptor in chronic infections and things. And uh, it tends to not affect the gut microbiome, which is really important. Um, xylitol love, that'd probably be my second favorite. I do agree with you with honey and maple syrup. If you're going to use uh, sweeteners, use real, use real if possible. Just don't use the refined cane sugar. Totally avoid mm -hmm. that one. Um, and monk fruit and palm, coconut palm sugar tend to be a little lower glycemic, but there's still all those things. If you have prediabetes or really watching blood sugar, even the honey or maple syrup is going to affect, but it's still more natural and nutritive. It has nutrients than your white table sugar. And then like someone who's really low glycemic, for either diabetic reasons or otherwise, the stevia, the xylitol don't have as much effect on the blood sugar. So that's kind of the range and they're all um, available. I do notice with the sugar alcohols, if someone has underlying gut dysbiosis, until you treat it, they tend to get gas and bloating because those sugar alcohols stay in the lumen of the gut and they don't get absorbed. So the bacteria have a party and you'll have gas and bloating. If you have like these xylitol brownies and eat a lot of them, you're gonna be like, what happened to my gut? So, right. Yeah. The whole FODMAPs <laughs> yeah. kind of idea, right? Um, Speaking of gut, let's tell me a little bit about how you, I mean, we both like gut is the core. But how does that relate to immune system? And um, what are some core things people could do to have healthy guts? Well, first is probably finding out if you have any kind of infections, whether it's in your oral microbiome, your nasal microbiome, your GI, you know, in the large intestine, do you have 
Do you have a, a small a, a intestinal bacterial overgrowth in your, in your small intestine? So finding those infections are really important to work with a doctor like Jill or I, because 80% of your immune system, is it, it, it is 80%, mm -hmm. isn't it, it is. Jill? Yeah. 80% of our immune system comes off of that lymphocyte, those lymphocytes all through our GI tract. So we need a healthy microbiome whispering, right? That's what it does. It whispers and it gives, it gives feedback to what the environment is, it, what kind of environment we're building in that GI. So if we have you know, things growing in, in our garden, that weeds growing in our garden, they're going to take nutrients, they're going to create inflammation, they're going to create a different environment that's going to invite other things in. So I don't know, Jill, if you see this, but a lot of people will have some dysbiosis, they'll have bacterial overgrowths, or maybe some yeast overgrowths, and all of a sudden it invites in a protozoa, right, that they get exposed to that normally you might not hold on to that protozoa. So when I see a protozoa in somebody's um, you know, GI workup, I'm thinking, wow, we've probably had some leaky gut and some, some dysbiosis going on for a while. So what, what are the things that I do? You know, probiotics are important, but knowing which probiotics, as Jill speaks to beautifully um, for Microbiome Labs and some of these other companies, knowing the right kind of probiotic is pretty important. If you have histamine or SIBO, you're going to need a different kind of probiotic than if you have just an overgrowth of some bacteria in your large intestine. So probiotics are really important. Managing the diet, right? Eating the right things that are not going to feed these overgrowth um, are going to all help the immune system in the GI. And then something that um, naturopathic doctors like myself do a lot of is dry skin brushing to help move the lymph system. Because that lymph, if you move it all over your body with just short little uh, strokes with a, either a loofah or a, a dry skin brush that you can get at any of the natural food stores. All of that, moving that lymph really helps us detox, helps the, the GI actually. Um, and then also castor oil packs. I'm a huge fan of castor oil. I don't know about you, Jill, but I love castor oil. And um, specifically over the GI and over the liver and all the way up, if you have fibrocystic breasts or if you have ovarian cysts, you can actually get a cloth that goes all the way from your clavicle bones right here, all the way down to your pubic bone. And you really want to saturate it in castor oil. And I have all of this um, uh, on my website um, that I can share with you. And you lay with that on and you can either meditate or say your prayers or do deep breathing exercises and you lay for that for 45 minutes. And what it does is it brings down inflammation in the GI. So it's an old nature. I love nature that. Here. What a great and, and not expensive and practical and so simple. Um, and I know um, the dry brushing I've recommended to patients. Again, we've kind of stolen that from our naturopathic friends. And if you've been around lately, you've heard me talk about coffee enemas because I'm such a fan. Um, this requires a little more equipment and training. Um, but when I was in Switzerland, I just saw patients doing so well and they were not necessarily young and healthy. And part of the treatments there in the biological medicine center was coffee enemas. And I think of it as really, really simple because you, what you're talking about with with detox, we have excretion of toxins and, or mobilization of toxins and excretion. And so yes. basically when we mobilize uh, whether we're doing glutathione or IVs or uh, any of these things, and we can't excrete, we start to get sick. And a lot of people have heard of a Herxheimer reaction. All that is, is these things aren't in balance and we're pushing the mobilization so hard and we're not getting excretion or we're killing off organisms that are causing toxicity and you're not eliminating that from your body. And what I love about naturopathic medicine is you have a lot of things for excretion. It could be the castor oil, it could be coffee enemas, it could be colon hydrotherapy, it could be um, Epsom salt as. It could be mm -hmm. um, all of these things because just taking another pill won't necessarily help. Uh, the binders might help a little on that side, but a lot of other things like giving glutathione, giving N-acetylcysteine, giving some of these agents that push and mobilize toxins, that could make them worse if they're not excreting. So I love so, that you bring a lot to the table on those therapies. We, we call that the, hum we have to open all the homunctories. Love it. <laughs> and so do you, have you ever heard this term before? It's I very that from you, but it's not common vocabulary for me. <laughs> so, so the homunctories would be 
how are we at elimination? It's all elimination. The homunctories are um, elimination. So whether it's through your breath or whether it's through your sweat mm -hmm. or whether it's through your urine or your feces, it's, it's all trying to move things out and we have to open up those homunctories. And so a lot of the, the treatments that we employ are to open up those homunctories. And yes, we do. We give, we give things like bitters to help the gallbladder move better. We give all these antioxidants or anti, you know, anti-inflammatory herbs or different herbs to move toxicity. Um, the more you know about what kind of toxicity or what your exposure has been, the more specifically Jill or I can, you know, help you to what homunctory do we need to work on in order for you to move that out. And so, yes, yeah, so deep breathing is so important even for detoxification. Hydration, so important for detoxification through the kidneys, right? Fiber, so important for detox, th phase three detoxification now we call it, but as NDs, we've been thinking about that the whole time. Like how do we get detoxification? How do we get that homunctory of the colon working to your benefit, right? How do we get your kidneys to work to your benefit? How do we clean your blood and get, um, and get all of these things out? Yes, yeah, so that reminds me, there's some of the, you know, gurus on television talking about these ice baths and there's other, you know, there's all these things with hot, cold water therapy. From a naturopathic perspective, tell us a little bit more about that, whether it's used in the shower, like going hot and cold water or going into an ice bath. What does that do for the body? So what it does is it increases circulation which is really gonna help you both detox and get vitalized, meaning your cells just get more nutrients when we circulate our blood better. So one of, the, um, one of them is constitution or, or, or hydrotherapy, going from hot to cold. So you'll, if, you, if you were a patient of mine, you know this about me, I tell people to always end their shower with cold. Um, and it would be best, you know, or, or sits baths where you go between hot and cold, or even in the shower, you can go between hot and cold. And so sometimes I'll say, you know, three, three minutes hot, and then you wanna turn it as cold as you can. I don't wanna shock you, um, but, you would be sh you would be amazed at how invigorated you feel afterwards because all of a sudden you're going to feel this throbbing in your body and so what we do is if you have a certain area that we're trying to increase circulation to we focus on that area or it can be a whole body experience you know if you have the ability to go from a whole immersion of hot to a whole immersion of cold, that's gonna give you a whole body treatment. And what it does is it vasodilates you when you're in the hot, and when you get in the cold, it vasoconstricts and pumps your blood through all those little tiny capillaries in your fingers and your nose and your toes. So we're increasing circulation to get these nutrients, to get all of the things that we need for vitality moved throughout our body, right? Our chi moves better. So, um, in, in sits baths. So if you have pelvic issues, let's say um, you have you have reoccurring infections in your pelvic area, or you have pelvic floor dysfunction, or you have bladder infections on a regular basis, or you have GI problems, you can sit in hot water and then you want to go sit in cold water. And again, it's the contrast. If you can make it as cold as you can take it, and then go back to the hot for three minutes, back to the cold for a minute, back to the hot, and you always wanna end on cold because that's where you get the good. When you, when you vasodilate, you're gonna pool blood. So if you just take a hot bath and you don't end on cold, sometimes you can, you can be a little bit more swollen after a hot bath. Mm -hmm. So it's this idea of pumping your blood through your body more efficiently by using contrast hydrotherapy and mm -hmm. colon hydrotherapy is fantastic too. And that's, that's what Jill was talking about before where we use coffee enemas or different things to create this um, basically a new microbiome and also help pull out toxins. So, um, and, and then of course, drinking plenty of really great clean water. Um, we forget how important to all processes of the body you know, being really well hydrated, that's going to help your immune system immensely as well. Yeah, thanks for explaining that, because I've always known I do feel invigorated with that cold at the end there, but it's um, people I know want to know, and it's something you can do at home, you know, it's really practical. 
Um, I can't believe we've been talking an hour and we, we could talk another hour. This is so much fun. Um, I want to ask you two things before we, we end. And, and the first one is just, what would you leave? Like what, if there were one piece of advice, what would you leave uh, listeners with uh, on advice for this time? Like, um, to find a beautiful rhythm again in your life. Mm -hmm. So many people are struggling right now for a rhythm and our hormonal system, our immune system, our nervous system thrives on structure. Mm -hmm. So the more we can get up in the morning and go out into our backyard, nature, anywhere we can to get sunlight on our face and help our melatonin, because that's how our melatonin knows, we know to make melatonin at night is because of sun exposure in the morning. And then, you know, trying to focus on the best possible messages, um, you know, find or tiptoe back into exploring with wonderment your spiritual self, your, your, your ability to connect with your higher, um, with something higher that is watching over you, that loves you, that will sustain you, that will give you resilience at this time. And end your day by watching the sun go down. Just letting your body know, like the day is over and now it's time for rest. Like we're not gonna turn on our blue lights. We're not gonna turn on all of our lights and overstimulate ourselves and watch really pretty horrific news outlets that are gonna make us stress so then we can't sleep well. You know, just watch the sun go down, have some, a beautiful cup of tea, talk to people you love in any, any way that you can and just know that you are connected. Oh, that is such beautiful advice. And, and where can people find you, Dr. Pratt? Where can they find you? We'll, we'll link this up too, but. Sure. Um, so I have a website called The Pratt Clinics with an S on the end. So my name, um, and we can put a link in this for them too. Um, I am here in Colorado, but just like Jill, we see people all over the world. So we're lucky enough to do telemedicine and and be able to help lots of people in lots of different places. Yeah. Oh, this has been so fun. Um, thank you all for listening. And thank you, Dr. Pratt, for joining me today. And uh, we'll have to do this again because there's even more stuff we didn't get to cover. <laughs> I'd love to.